Amen. You may be seated. Good, good morning, Mercy Church. Morning. It is good to be with you. My name is Scott. If I have not had a chance to meet you yet, I'm one of the pastors here. And man, we came to church this morning, did we not? Listen, I came to worship my Jesus. I came to tell you about what God's word says about who he is. Because here's the reality. I think every single one of us from time to time need a little bit of perspective. Right? We need a little bit of perspective. We need to be able to see what's actually going on in the midst of difficult days. And in today's passage is a beautiful passage of perspective. God, uh, godly perspective is one of my favorite things in the world. You've been there. You know, you, you meet a follower of Jesus who's been where you are right now, and they give you some wisdom about the situation you're in, and, and you leave blown away by how godly and how wise they were and how helpful that conversation was. You know, those kind of conversations change our lives. Have you ever been in one of those? I know I have been in many. Like the time I was in a terrible relationship my freshman year of college, and my disciples were like, dude, you got to get out of this. This is a mess. And I was like, listen, you don't understand what we have, okay? Listen, we love each other. We're going to be together forever. And a week later, we were done. Uh, or about the time when uh, a couple years out of college, I got my first job. I was an insurance broker, and my boss was terrible. I know you think you have the worst boss, but you didn't. I had the worst boss. Her name was Eugenia. Sorry, Eugenia, if you're listening. She was the worst. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to go over her head. Because she is terrible, I'm going to go over her head, and thankfully, the man who was mentoring me was like, don't do that. That's a bad decision. Or uh, as, as, uh, as my marriage, you know, started out, you know, year one, my wife and I, you know, we never fought, and I was like, you know what, I think we need to write a book, because we never fight. We've got this marriage thing cracked. We got it, babe. Let's go. And then my mentor was like, that's cute. <laughs> that is real cute. You just haven't learned to be honest with each other yet. And I was like, oh, shoot. And then year two happened. You know, perspective is one of the most important things that we can have. Someone who's been there. And as I've gotten older, I've now been able to walk into those spaces of perspective. And I start to see the potholes that people that I disciple are about to walk into. And I'm like, hey, don't walk there. Don't walk there, or when they've already inevitably fallen in it, because we all do, I get to tell them about the goodness of God's love for them, and that it's going to be okay, and that their circumstances doesn't mean that God has changed. This morning, as we continue in our First and Second Samuel series, following the life of David, we're going to be able to take a collective breather. Because this morning is a passage of perspective about God's love for David, and in Second Samuel... What we're going to see in 20, uh, chapter 22 is a song that he wrote on the same day that the Lord rescued him from death. David is testifying to the love that he's experienced in some pretty unimaginable circumstances. Listen, we've had a lot of rough texts over the last 10 chapters, am I right? Don't we need a little bit of perspective, amen? Well, this is this chapter. But if you've been wondering, sometimes like me, hey, like what in the world is going on in 2 Samuel? Why is it so dark? And what the heck do I have to learn from this? Well, the Apostle Paul helps us a little bit here. Romans 15 verse 4. I think this is helpful for us. Here's what the Apostle Paul says. For whatever was written in former days, they were written for our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures that we might have hope. As the Apostle Paul was writing to the Romans, he's reminding them that whatever was written in the Old Testament was written to instruct us. Why? So that we can find endurance in the scriptures and ultimately find hope in Christ. That's what we all want, right? 
So all these stories that we've been walking through, listen, they're for your good. These stories, these scriptures were not only written for God's purposes at the time that they were written, but they're also written for anyone who's to read them for ages to come. And in today's passage, we're going to see one big main idea. So write this down. Here's the big idea. God has chosen to love you. God has chosen to love you. So no matter what you're going through in life, because God has chosen to love you, he is going to get you through it. And in this passage, we see five ways in which God loves David. And that's how we're going to break down our passage today in 2 Samuel 22. These are amazing. So I'm going to show you five ways that God loves you based off of that. Here's the first thing. God loves you by hearing your prayers. God loves you by fighting for you. God loves you by delighting in you. God loves you by protecting you. And God loves you by including you as a participant in his story. Amen? Amen. Y'all ready? Chapter 22, verse 1. Here we go. David spoke the words of this song to the Lord. And on the day of the Lord, rescuing him from the grasp of all his enemies and from the grasp of Saul. And he said, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my God, my rock where I seek refuge, my shield, the horn of my salvation, my stronghold, my refuge, my savior. You saved me from violence. I called to the Lord who is worthy of praise. I was saved from my enemies for the waves of death engulfed me. The torrents of destruction terrified me. The ropes of Sheol entangled me. The snares of death confronted me. I called to the Lord in my distress. I called to my God. And from his temple, he heard my voice. And my cry for help reached his ears. Here's the first thing we see this morning. The ways that God loves you. God loves you by hearing your prayers. God loves you by hearing for your hearing your prayers. In verse one, we see the context in which David was writing this song. God had just rescued him from certain death at the hands of Saul. And this, you know, there isn't really a scholarly consensus at the exact moment where this uh, song was written, but most likely it was when he was on the run in 1 Samuel 20. And look at what he said about the Lord. He starts testifying to the power that he's experienced. He said, my Lord, the Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my shield, and so on. His relationship with God was a personal one. It was a personal relationship. There are 12 my's in the first three verses. Notice that God didn't, or that David didn't start with his circumstances. He started with testifying to who who he has known God to be throughout his life. God has always been there for him. And since God has been there for him, his present circumstances didn't all of a sudden mean that God had somehow changed. And particularly in this moment, because his terrible circumstances were not because of anything that he had done wrong. Like he hadn't done anything wrong in this moment to be on the run. And some of us, when we face tough circumstances for our sins, we're like, yeah, that makes sense because it's, you know, I, I was the one who sinned. But in this case, it wasn't David's sin, it was Saul. Saul was jealous and he was after David. That was it. And he was on the run and God shows up for him. How? By hearing David's prayers. Verse four, I called to the Lord who is worthy of praise and he rescued me from my enemies. David called to the Lord. And in verse seven, he says it again. I called to the Lord in my distress. I called and my God, uh, I called to my God from his temple. Basically heaven, he heard my prayers, my voice My cry reached his ears. God always hears you. So what do you do when life goes sideways? Do you call to the Lord or do you lean on yourself? Look at what David did. David is saying, since I know God to be my rock, since I know him to be my fortress, my deliverer where I seek refuge, since he's been there for me in the past, he will be there for me now. His salvation was in the Lord. Now, did David always respond or feel like God was responding to him in this way? No. Flip over to Psalm chapter 10. Psalm chapter 10, David says this. Why, O Lord, did you stand far away? Why do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself from me in times of trouble? Now, is David contradicting himself? No. Here's what he's doing. He's sharing how he's feeling in that moment. Does that make sense? That's how he's feeling in that moment. It feels like you're far off, God. 
It feels like you don't hear me. Have we been there? If it feels like you're far off, Lord, it, it's not true. We've been there. Maybe you're there now. Where are you, Lord? That's what David is saying in Psalm 10. But look at the end of the Psalm, at the end of, the, of Psalm 10 in verse 17. Then he says, oh, Lord, you hear the desire of the afflicted. You will strengthen their heart. You will incline your ear. David is honest with God about how he feels in, in chapter 10, verse 1. But at the end of the prayer, then he claims what he knows to be true about God. God hears us. If you feel like you're in a spot where God isn't hearing you, keep calling him. He hears you. God loves hearing your prayers for help. He hears your cries. Don't stop. He listens to David's prayer, and then he shows up for him in his time of need. Look at what David says in verse 8 of 2 Samuel 22. He says, Then the earth shook and quaked. The foundations of the heavens trembled. They looked because he burned with anger. Smoke rose from his nostrils, and consuming fire came from his mouth. Coals were set ablaze by it. He bent the heavens and came down total darkness Beneath his feet, he rode on the cherub and flew, soaring on the winds, the wings of the wind. He made darkness a canopy around him, gathering a water and thick clouds. From the radiance of his presence, blazing coals were ignited. The Lord thundered from heaven. The Most High made his voice heard. He shot arrows and scattered them. He hurled them like lightning bolts and routed them. The depths of the sea became visible. The foundations of the world were exposed at the rebuke of the Lord, at the blast of the breath of his, of his nostrils. What an incredible response. And here's what we see here that was true for David, and it's true for you, is that God loves you by fighting for you. God loves you by fighting for you. So what we read here is a poetic display of a dramatic metaphor. David is using powerful descriptive imagery to illustrate the experience that he had. Verse 8 says, then the earth shook and quaked, and the foundations of the heavens trembled. They shook because he burned with anger. God burned with anger. God's response to David's circumstances was anger. God was angry, and he was angered at how Saul was after David. He was angry because God loved David. And if God loves you, evil acts against those he loves is not okay with him. And as I was thinking about this passage, it reminded me of a story that my wife uh, came in and told me about a year ago. She took our kids to the park and, and uh, I, I took, I have five kids, so I kept the littles and she took the olders and um, we don't usually call them the littles and the olders. I don't know why I said that, but anyways. Uh, <laughs> So she walked in the door uh, when she got back from taking them to the park and she walked in like this uh, and she said, Scott, I just yelled at a teenager in the park. And I was like, oh no. Because my, if anyone knows my wife, my wife is not very animated. She's very quiet. She's super chill. And if she yells at someone, something is really wrong, okay? So I was like, oh no, what happened? Basically, there was a teenager at the park that was trying to spit on one of my kids' heads. And Jess, mama bared that kid back to Jesus. Basically, that's what happened. She, she got mad, y'all. And basically, that's what David is trying to illustrate here. Some of you might be thinking, why anger? I thought God was a God of love. Why didn't he respond to them in love? Yes, he's a God of love, but he is angry because he loves don't miss that. The extent of his anger right here shows us the extent of God's love for David. Church, God is not indifferent to the fact that David's enemies were surrounding him. And God is not indifferent about your circumstances. Especially like in David's situation in this passage, the circumstances were not of his choosing. God cares. How do we know that? We know that by the cross. We know that by the ultimate display that of his love for us, his cross, he him dying on the cross, it was God's ultimate display of his love for us, but also his anger. We can measure God's love for us by the lengths that he went to save you, namely sending his son, 
But we can also measure his anger towards sin and the brokenness in the world by the wrath that he poured out onto his son. Isaiah 53 says something that is just mind-blowing. It's hard to even wrap our head around, but it said that God was pleased to crush his son in order to save us. Only love can do that. And God loves you by fighting for you. Church, don't miss that. He was angry about David's situation. And when you suffer unjustly, he is angry about it. I love that God has a powerful emotion towards your experience. I love that he has a powerful emotion towards David, David's experience because there are days where I'll be honest, where I wonder, am I going to get through this situation? This might be the thing that takes me out because this is too hard. But no, God fights for me. And if Jesus didn't abandon you and I on the cross in his darkest hour, he's not going to abandon you or me in our darkest hour. He fights for us. Why? Why does he do it? Well, let's look at, look at verse 17 through 20. If you read with me, he reached down from on high and he took hold of me. He pulled me out of deep water. He rescued me from my powerful enemy and from those who, who hated me. For they were too strong for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity. But the Lord was my support. He brought me out to a spacious place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. Here's the third thing we see about God's love. God loves you by delighting in you. David says that God rescued him simply because he delighted in him. And some of you just need to hear that this morning. God loves you simply because he wanted to. He loves you because he does. If I had to summarize what God's delight is like, I would say it this way. He loves you and he likes who you are. He loves you and he likes you. Now, was there anything particularly amazing about David? No, but God decided to love him. David said, you know, that, that God reached down from on high and took hold of me. He pulled me out of the deep water. God chose to love David simply because he wanted to. And here he's pointing out a greater reality that we're gonna see in a moment because in this particular moment that he's writing this, he wasn't actually physically in water. No, he's pointing to God's sovereign hand in his help. A lot like David, a lot like Moses was chosen by God for a particular purpose. He chose Moses a lot like he chose David. He chose to love them and use them. But remember the circumstances of God choosing Moses? Things weren't great. Actually, things were pretty terrible. Moses, uh, sorry, Pharaoh was trying to kill all the Jewish males. So in desperation, Moses' mother placed him in a basket and pushed him out and he floated away. And somehow he just happened to fall right at the feet of Pharaoh's daughter. God's hand was there. And when she noticed that this was a Jewish child, she named him Moses, which in Hebrew sounds a lot like Masha, to draw out of the water. That name is also closely related to the Egyptian word for sun. So she chose the name that sounded like to draw out of water in Hebrew and sun in Egyptian. But the greater reality is that God used Pharaoh's daughter as a means to draw out a savior for Israel so that he could love them. That's amazing. Do you see what David's doing here? He's starting to show us how God views him. God drew him out of the deep waters. He has set David apart. We see in 1 Samuel 16, this reality that God told Samuel, the author of this book, that the king of Israel was to be born from the line of a man named Jesse. But God didn't choose the boy that we would have thought, right? He didn't choose the boy we would have thought. He chose this little kid who was working out as a shepherd. Y'all, this is how bad it was. When Samuel showed up to look at the candidates, his dad didn't even include him. He's still out in the pasture. He didn't even include him in the list. Didn't even bring him as an option. But God chose to love David. God's love rested on David the same way it did with Moses. God chose to delight in them. And in verse 20, it says exactly that. He rescued me because he delighted in me. And God's delight in him was how David based his entire identity. This is huge. 
David knew where he stood with God. We see this in verse 21 through 25. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness. He repaid me according to the cleanness of my hands. For I have kept the ways of the Lord, and I have not turned from my God to wickedness. Indeed, I let all of his ordinances guide me, and I have not disregarded his statutes. I was blameless before him and kept myself from my iniquity. So the Lord repaid me according to my righteousness, according to, the, to my cleanness in his sight. In his sight is important there. Now, why did God rescue him? He delighted in him. These verses show how David view him, views himself. And some of you might look at this passage and say, how can this be? How could he possibly view himself like that? David, we know what you're gonna do later on. Your hands aren't clean. No, I don't think David views himself as sinless. We know that from verses like, like in Psalm 51 where he tells the Lord that he'd sinned against him and him alone. No, the only way that these things can be said is because he knows that it's how God views him, not necessarily how he views himself. An important thing for us to remember in the context of First and Second Samuel is that David is called the man after God's own heart. In 1 Samuel 13, it says that God rejected Saul and was going to find a king who was going to be a man after his own heart. And many of us have been having a really hard time with 1 and 2 Samuel because we're wondering, how is this the man after God's own heart? David is straight up terrible, right? How many of you felt that? David is terrible. One person, great. David is terrible. But I think we're misunderstanding what God actually meant there. The point of 1 and 2 Samuel isn't to prove to the reader that David was, in fact, a man after God's own heart. That wasn't the point. The point was to show us God's own heart for David. It's the place that David in the, had in the heart of God, not the place that God had in the heart of David. David was a sinner, but God chose to love him anyways, and David knew that. And he built his whole identity off of that. Sometimes it can make us even mad at the thought of David viewing himself in this way. And if that's true, maybe it's because right now you're forgetting the gospel. I mean, why did God die for you? Was it because you and I were great? No. He died for you because he delighted in you. You're a sinner, yet God delights in you anyways. The great journey of the Christian life is us believing who God says we are, not making ourselves into who we need to be in order for God to love us. Like David, we need to build our identity and our security in the fact that God rescues us simply because he's chosen to love us. The promise of God is that he saves the humble. Humility here means that you realize that you are hopeless without Christ, yet you are simultaneously of great value to him. That's amazing that we can be sinful yet valued. God is awesome. Another helpful verse here in his, is verse 25. So the Lord re repaid me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands. Let, let, let's talk about a little theology here. How, how can he be righteous? How can he be made clean? You know, this answers a question that many of us ask. How can people from the Old Testament be saved? How can they go to heaven? Because Christ hasn't come, he hasn't died yet, right? So how is this possible? Well, the answer is, they were made righteous the same way that we are made righteous. Romans 4.3 appeals uh, to the faith of Abraham, and it says this way, it answers this question for us. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him for righteousness, now to the one who works, pay is not credited as a gift, but as something owed. But to the one who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited for righteousness. Abraham, Moses, David, all the people from the Old Testament who put their faith in Yahweh, who put their faith in God, God's righteousness is imputed to them. Imputed means that it's credited to their account. God's righteousness credited to their account. David is saved the same way that we are, imputed righteousness. 
Old Testament people are saved by putting their faith in a Christ that was to come, and New Testament people are saved by putting their faith in a Christ of the past. Our salvation comes from Christ regardless because he chose to delight in us. Hebrews 12 12 says, for the joy that was set before him. For the joy that was, what was his joy? You. You were his joy. I was his joy. But not only does he delight in us, he protects us. 31 through 37 says this, God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is pure. He is a shield to all who take refuge in him. For who is God besides the Lord and who is our rock? God is my refuge. He makes his way perfect. Skip down to 38. I pursue my enemies and I destroy them. I do not turn back until they are wiped out. Here's the thing that we see here is that God loves you by protecting you. If we focus on verse 32, I think we're able to summarize this whole section, 31 through 37. David poses a question for who is God besides the Lord? And who is our rock? Only our God. David is hinting at the fact that there are others who don't believe in this God. He's saying only Yahweh, only the God of Israel is the rock. But so many in his day and so many in in our day as well build our lives on a rock that will never actually protect them. In our culture, the God of our age is the God of me. We think we know what's best and and we we do anything to build walls of protection around our lives. And all seems good until crisis happens. And then we realize that we can't actually protect ourselves. It's a fool's errand. We lean on false idols to protect us. And an idol is trusting in anything other than God to provide for us what only God can provide. David's word is a warning to us. Don't be fooled, he says in verse 31. Only God's way is perfect. The word of the Lord is pure. He's a shield to those who take refuge in him. The way we take refuge in him is by trusting in his love for us through his word. One of the many temptations of terrible circumstances. Now I want you all to lean in with me. One of the many temptations of terrible circumstances that we can walk away from God's protection. God's word protects us because it tells us the truth about who we are and it tells us the truth about who he is. And we can find hope in it. And what's difficult is many of us can walk away from God and walk away from his word in hard times and then we start to lean on other rocks for hope, other worldly philosophies, Paul saw this in his day. In Colossians chapter two, he says this starting in verse six. So then, just as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to walk in him, being rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, overflowing with gratitude. Be careful that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit based on human tradition, based on the elements of this world rather than Christ. When things get difficult, church, you need to be on guard. When things are hard, we're tempted to find ways out other than leaning into the rock of our salvation. But listen, it's only going to lead to more destruction. Why be on guard? Because these worldly philosophies, they don't love you. In fact, not one of them chose to die for you on the cross. But Christ did. And he can protect you. Worldly philosophies are the enemy's way of, uh, of destroying you through ideas that actually sound kind of plausible or sound, oh, that makes sense. Follow your heart. Love is love. Do you. So how can we tell if it's a worldly philosophy? I don't have a ton of time here. But in summary, worldly philosophies, particularly in America, are hyper-focused on you and you being able to live however you want. Biblical truth doesn't work that way. It didn't work in the same way. The way of Christ tells us to not live for ourselves, but rather die to our desires and choose his. Because our desires are broken and it's not going to lead to our flourishing. But what's amazing about God is that his design is for our flourishing. So when he gives us boundaries, it's not God being mean. It's not God trying to keep you from fun. It's God trying to keep you within his design for the maximum amount of flourishing. 
And that's going to include self-denial. You're going to have to deny your flesh. But his plan is never to harm you, ever. But to save us from ourselves. Verse 46, 42 through 46 shows us a chilling reality here. Chilling reality for those who lean on any other rock except Christ. They look, but there is no one to save them. They look to the Lord, but he does not answer them. So what happens here is they're calling out to God, but they're not calling out to God because they actually love him. They just want something from him. Psalm 145 verse 18 comments on this by saying that the Lord is near to all who call on him, but you have to call in a certain way to all who call on him in truth. This is a word for all of us in the room that you either, when you hear the gospel, you either surrender to it or you harden yourself to it. There's no in between. If you don't know Jesus, my what I beg you this morning is to look at all of these benefits. Look at all of them. Surrender to Christ because he came after you. He loves you. He loves you to the point of leaving heaven to come down here as a man. I don't know, I don't know about you, but we, we, we ain't, we're, we're rough, y'all. We are pretty tough. And he came down here to be with us, to sympathize with us. To be able to relate. Therefore, he's our high priest, able to sympathize with us. And then he went to the cross to die for your sin because our sin has separated us from God. Our sin has separated us from God, but God lived the perfect life that you should have lived. He died the death that you know deep down in your heart that you actually deserve. But he went to the cross for you, and then he was buried in a tomb, and they're like, he's done. Enemies celebrating. And then Jesus got up out of that grave. He got out of that grave to defeat sin, to defeat death, so that we could look upon him and say, that is God, because only God doesn't stay dead. And what I love here is that God includes us in his story. The fifth way that God loves us, let's see this. Therefore, I will give thanks to you among the nations, O Lord. This movement's going to go global. I will sing praises about your name. He is a tower of salvation for his king. He shows loyalty to his anointed and to David and his descendants forever. Here's the last thing that we're going to see today. Is that God loves you by including you as a participant in his story. <laughs> You and me. Like he includes us in his story and his plan of salvation for all nations. That's amazing. This week and next week, like these are the last two weeks of the first and second Samuel series. Israel wanted a king, but the promise to God to the world would be realized, but not through David. First and second Samuel, you know, what you see and the, then you see for first and second Kings, what we see is king after king, kings come and kings go, pointing to the reality that there was a true king that had yet to come. A Messiah king who wouldn't sit on an earthly throne, but a heavenly one, Jesus from the house of David. And here's an example of how God includes us in his story. Hundreds of years later, on an unsuspecting night, an angel showed up to a teenage girl. She's sitting there minding her own business. And this angel showed up to her and told her something that was going to be hard to believe. The angel said, Mary, you're going to give birth to a child. And that's wild because she was a virgin and betrothed to a man. But this man that she was betrothed to was from the line of David. And she was sitting in the same fields that David used to sit in as a shepherd boy. And, she told, and he told that child that this promised one would come to save the world. Jesus would be the ruler of the nations. And just like Mary, Jesus includes us as participants of his story. My question to you is, will you join him in it? Because God's plan A to reach the world isn't through just individual Lone Ranger Christians. No, God's plan A to reach the world is through local churches. 
So my question to you is, what are you doing right now to give it all to King Jesus? What are you doing right now to make sure that everyone in your office knows that there is a Jesus that loves them? What are you doing right now to disciple your children, to get on your knees with them and help them to know who Jesus is? What are you doing in your neighborhood? How are you making him known? God loves you and he, uh, we want others to experience the same love that we have, that we've experienced, that we know that we know to be true. In our church, we exist to make disciples who love God, love each other, and love our world because we want to see a gospel awakening in the city of Charlotte that is carried to the ends of the earth because there are people around the world that have never even heard the name of Jesus who need to know that there is a God who loves them in this way. May we give every bit of our life. May we make it our godly ambition as a church to make sure that this city knows that there is a God who delights in them. That the world knows that there is a God who delights in them and loves them and wants to bring them home. Amen? Amen. Let me pray. God, we love you. Lord, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy, your kindness, your love. Lord, as I've studied this passage, I've been blown away, God, by your love for us. So many ways that you love us. So many ways that you delight in us. Lord, I pray that we would believe that this morning, that we would surrender to it, and that we would make it our ambition to make disciples who love God, who love you, who love one another, and who love our world. Jesus, may we follow your example and sacrifice all that we have to not live for ourselves, but to live for you, who died and was raised to make disciples of all nations. We love you. We pray this.